And welcome inside the studio. Thanks for joining us on this wild Q&A session on Facebook Live with Wes Walls, Mike Greenlay. I'm Anthony LaPanta. The Minnesota Wild season preview show can be seen tonight on Fox Sports North, immediately following the Twins Live postgame show after the Twins and Tigers resume their series in Detroit. Our focus is on hockey today. We welcome your questions. You can post them, and we'll get to as many of them as we can throughout the day today. First, we had a chance to watch the Wild in person last night with the first home exhibition game. Game. wasn't a thing of beauty, but there were some positives for Minnesota in a 1-0 win. Oh, I thought they played well in front of their goaltender. I thought, you know, when you protect your goaltender and you play well in front of them and don't give up glaring opportunities, you've got to keep in mind that they're trying new systems and the players aren't used to playing with each other. So when you don't give up glaring chances, that's usually everybody keeping in mind what their real job is, and that, that was a positive for me. Yeah, and in, obviously in preseason games, and I played in lots of them over the course of the years, I mean, when you, when you get half the guys in the lineup that have played a lot in the minors, there's not a lot of uh, cohesiveness, so you tend to see some scrambly games. Uh, the level of play obviously will pick up as we get closer to the end of um, preseason, but for me, the, the greatest takeaway from last night's game was, was really one thing, and that's Alex Daylock, uh, because I think we all recognize around here um, how important it's going to be to have a backup goalie that can win 10 games this year. Because uh, um, if your backup goaltender is struggling with his game, um, you're going to be giving points back to other teams around the Western Conference, and it's going to be a battle throughout the whole season. 10 might be a low number if Bruce Boudreau sticks with his plan to play him 25 times. He's, you need more than perhaps 10 wins from Alex Daylock. If you're going to run him out there 25 times, this has to be a guy where the team doesn't see their game disintegrate because he's in the net. Yeah, that's true, and the schedule's a little different this year. I mean, there's, the games aren't quite as compacted as they have been in the, in the past. So uh, 63 games for Devin last year with the way the schedule was set up was a heavy, heavy number. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him play um, 65, so that only leaves 20. So I guess, you know what, it's, you know, it leaves 17 or so, but it, it's, everything's fluid. I mean, you just don't know how the, the season's going to play out. I mean, obviously, the goaltending situation with the backups has been really something that hasn't been completely nailed down here over the last few years. I think for Boudreaux, he's, he's going to have to read uh, how Devin Dubnik is, and, and I think more than the number, it's the timing of when you put him in there. Uh, if you have a short stretch of games or if your team isn't on, on fire or if, you know, or if you're playing a certain, like a lot of Central Division teams or something, timing is going to be important as to when you play your goaltenders. And I think if Staylock can do what he does like he did last season in the two games and, and shows signs of like he did in the preseason here, it's going to really give Devin Dubnik not just a physical break but a mental one too. I mean, even though he's a happy-go-lucky type of guy, I mean, he still has to be focused, and that focus drains you mentally. So he's going to need some breaks, and then hopefully stay luck and step in. Well, last season he went in with the plan to play Darcy Kemper 25 times yeah. and then just didn't have the confidence in him, and those starts became fewer and further between as the season progressed. So hopefully they can stay on that plan as you head into this season. Obviously there are a lot of questions around this wild club heading into this season. One thing that isn't a question is their leadership core Miko Koivu inked to a two-year extension, so you know now for the foreseeable future, this team's leaders will be Miko Koivu, Zach Parisi, Ryan Suter, and that has to help provide some stability inside that locker room. I've always called Miko Koivu the glue. I mean, he, that, and, and Wes alluded to it in our preseason special, and that is that he's, like Chuck Fletcher said, he's a flag in the ground. Uh, this is a guy that you can trust. And, I mean, when you trust him, you can trust him everywhere, on the ice, in the locker room, uh, out in the community. He's a guy that you know what to expect from. He's always going to carry himself professionally. He's always going to be thoughtful about what he's doing and saying. I mean, this is the kind of guy that you want to – you know, keep as, as, as one of your central structures. Now, of course, the other players can do that as well, but when you got the C on your sweater and when you've just extended them like that, there's a reason, and it has to do with trust. Well, it's, it's funny. There's a lot of uh, armchair quarterbacks out there when after, you know, Miko signed early in the season, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I was a little surprised too because you really you don't think about it too much. Uh, you know, if he would not have signed as the season gone on, the media would have talked a lot more about it than obviously it would have been front and center and it would have been a distraction. There's no doubt about it. And I've been in locker rooms um, with guys that are in contract squabbles and, you know, w w whether this contract's going to get signed or not. You know, when you look at the way the, the league is set up now with a cap situation and not knowing for sure next year, is the cap going to go up $5 million? Is it going to go up only a million and a half? I think with this cap hit with Miko Koivu being at five and a half, and he was, I believe, six and a half, you give a million dollars back, 
Uh, I mean, if Miko goes out play, playing with Mikhail Granlin, by the way, who's uh, who's turning into a superstar, so Miko's going to put up numbers playing with Mikhail Granlin. Um, he puts up another 60-point season. You're looking at comparables around the league like Bergeron. You're looking at guys making $7.5 million a year. So um, I thought it was a real smart move by Chuck Fletcher getting him locked in early. Remember that line really solidified itself last year with Koivu, Granlin, and Zucker. They played together from November on, and they might have been the best two-way line in all of hockey last season, all of them finishing at the very least in the mid-20s in terms of plus-minus. We want to hear from you, answer your questions. Go to the Fox Sports Note. You're already there if you're watching the Fox Sports North Facebook page and let us know your questions. Kelly Krause wants to know which of the Wilds off-season additions is your favorite when you look at Ennis, Felino, Cullen. Which one stands out most? You know what? I, I, I like guys that are responsible. I, I've, I've actually been around Matt Cullen his whole career. I mean, when he was in Anaheim, I was there as a broadcaster. Uh, he was here, obviously, as you mentioned earlier, uh, as, as his first term here, and now he's back. I love guys that are responsible. He's a, he's a good two-way center, but what I really like about Matt Cullen is his versatility. Uh, I, how many times in the last two years did you see Malkin go down or, or you know, Crosby or another guy uh, that's a top line type guy and all of a sudden Matt Cullen's up there and he didn't look out of place. If you can have a guy that can provide those kind of minutes anywhere in your lineup, that's always a plus to me. I've known Matt Cullen longer. I called his game for his <laughs> Oh, here, here, here we go. Buzz. I know I've known I was, him longer than it you was, guys. It wasn't meant to be a competition. I've known him since I his dad <laughs> was his coach at Moorhead High playing against oh. Mark Parrish and Ben Clymer at Blue and Jefferson. All right, you get first place. Great job. Great job. All right, bring how about that? With the additions and subtractions on defense, how do you see the back end holding up this year? The one key subtraction is Marco Scandella. They lose a big physical defenseman, a mobile defenseman with a long reach, could shoot the puck. How do you see the Wild making up for the loss of Scandella? This question comes from Marshall Agri. Well, it's, it's not going to be easy. I mean, he played heavy minutes for the Minnesota Wild, and it seemed like whenever it was a big game in the playoffs or even down the stretch, Marco was able to, to elevate his game. It's, uh, you can't overlook that loss. I mean, he's, he's an out, he was an outstanding defenseman, um, but this is going to give opportunity to Matt Dumba. You look at Matt Dumba over the last 10 games of the season into the playoffs, I thought he played really well in the playoffs here last year. So he's going to get a, a great opportunity to, to grab hold of that number four guy. And uh, guys like Mikey Riley and uh, uh, Gustav Olsen, everybody's talking about. Um, Kyle Quincy they brought in. Uh, Nick Seeler, by the way, has looked really, really solid in a wild uniform. Uh, Eden Prairie boy, he's, uh, he's looked really, really good. Whether he start, sticks with the team or not, um, I got a feeling at some point he's going to play some games throughout the course of the season as but, well. Don't the over depth on the blue line is a big reason why this deal was possible because you mentioned guys like Seeler, and he's a couple down the list. Carson Soucy, he's a couple down the list because you've got guys like Riley and Olsen. Murphy, Murphy yeah. got 150 Quincy. games under his belt. So right, I mean, yeah, they've got some guys on the back end there that you need somebody to step up, but you've got four or five different possibilities that could be that one guy. Yeah, and, and to be able to, now you don't always have the flexibility to move guys up and down from Iowa and, and, and the NHL, but there are some guys that you can do that with, and so I, I know that Chuck Fletcher used that flexibility when he had it last year and the year before. He's going to likely do it again if he has to. But uh, I, I like your point about Matt Dumba. He's got to, you know, we talk about guys taking the next step. He, he's been playing with Suter in training camp. That can't hurt him. And I think if you can mix and match some guys throughout your lineup, you know, and, and not just have the five, six pairing, you know, have, a, have some pairings where you can mix uh, some veteran guys with some of the young guys to help develop them a bit, I think it's going to be great. Dumba playing with Suter creates opportunity, but it also brings responsibility because now you're going to be on the ice a little bit more. You're going to be on the ice against the other team's best a little bit more often so it'll be interesting to see how that works out if it works it gives Minnesota two sets of defensemen on which Bruce Boudreaux should be able to rely with Brodine and Spurgeon as the second set but Dumba has to prove he can handle it against the other team's best well the the elite teams um, in the National Hockey League have four top defensemen if you have three uh, you're probably going to be a team that's going to be on the outside looking in so there's a lot of pressure on these top four defensemen to 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 be solid and, and one thing that people don't really recognize is when you've when Marco Scandella was here and you've got Matt Dumba you've got five guys if four guys are going you're going to be set that takes the pressure off those five guys when you need four D-men going every night and you've you've got four 
A lot of pressure, man. That's a, that's like the that's like the starting goaltender yep. and the backup goalie, knowing your nookie blankies over yeah. there. If I'm not playing well, yep. if you look over there and you see a goalie that I mean, you've you've dealt with that yourself. You know what that feels like. Yeah, you definitely have to. I mean, you you can't uh, you can't draw from a well that's not giving you anything. And so you're right. If you have to have, that's what we keep talking about depth of the lineup. Because hey, let's face it, you're not going to always have 12 forwards hustling every night. You're not going to always have uh, four or five D hustling every night. And that's when a guy like Boudreaux, and we've talked about it, where he'll play his lineup maybe one, two periods, but when he starts to recognize that things need to change, he changes them. And the flexibility to be able to change them, that's the important part. Well, and so that leads into the forward discussion where, assuming Zach Parisi's healthy, and it sounds like he's taking steps that way and is, is likely to be ready on opening night, you can go into the season with a line that he's got Eric Stahl playing with Nino and Zach. You've got the Grandland koibu zucker line that was so good last year. Now you've created a situation where then on the third and fourth lines, you've got a number of guys who on a given night could move up for a while, they could move them down for a while. And I think the third line is the one that's intriguing to watch. Newly acquired Marcus Foligno playing with Charlie Coyle and Erickson Eck. A lot of questions about Erickson Eck and what we expect to see his role. One of them comes from Jacob Sundheim who says, what do you expect his role to be? I think that's where it's likely to start is on the third line, allowing Charlie Coyle to spend most of that time on the wing. Yeah, I mean, everything's going to be fluid. I mean, we've been around Bruce now for a full year. We, we, we know you guys are calling all the games. I mean, if guys aren't going, you know, he doesn't wait to get back in the locker room. If guys aren't going, he's making moves during the course of the game. I'm a big fan of that, especially when you play in as many one-goal games as you do. If you can't sometimes have the luxury of waiting five minutes to go back in the locker room, um, the coaches communicate on, on the bench, and guys got to be going. And when you look at the depth of this team up front, I mean, you, you know, when you thought of the Minnesota Wild before, you always thought well, the depth on the back end was unbelievable. It's amazing how losing one guy um, allows opportunities for other guys. But right now, the depth of this club up front is off the charts, really. You have to have guys capable of moving them around in order to make those in-game adjustments. And right now, if you look at what his fourth line could potentially be on a given night, Matt Cullen in the middle with Tyler Ennis on one wing, whether it be Winnick or Stewart or whoever on the other side, you've got a number of guys down there now that are capable, maybe not for a 25-game stretch, but are capable of jumping up and playing on the first line right wing, playing on, bumping down to play the third line, whatever it might be. You have to have talent down there in order to make those changes. The other thing you have is a coach that is very willing to move guys anywhere. And we've seen in the past, whether it's this team or other teams, where the coaches are a little bit reluctant to take a guy who is – typically a top line guy or a second line guy and put him on the third or fourth line because then he's got to deal with you know attitudes you got to deal with with different things but Brudreau he's like he'll he'll walk up right to a guy he could be a premier guy and say you're not going tonight I mean you're you're not playing well tonight so I'm you're playing here I'm putting this guy there and even though the player will come to him after the game he'll talk to them the, the bottom line is he'll say you tell me uh, that I should have done anything different usually the players will say yeah, okay, all right, fine. And then the next, next game, that guy's hustling. But Boudreaux has already made that known, that I'm going to put guys out there that you just mentioned. It could be middle of the game, could be after the period. He makes changes, and he doesn't apologize for it. Yeah. And that's what I like about a veteran coach like Boudreaux. Andrew Kinner wants to know, what type of role and impact can we expect from Tyler Ennis? Well, uh, I will say this. In, in my career, um, Sometimes we get an opportunity to, to get a, a new environment and get out of certain situations. Um, it, can, it, can, it can mean the world for you. You look at uh, Nino Niederreiter getting out of the island there for a couple years. His, his, his career flourished. Um, you know, um, Devin Dubnik, I mean, really how his career has taken off. Tyler Ennis has played his whole career eight years. Um, the first year was only ten games, so really seven. But seven, eight years in one spot in Buffalo. Um, playing for a team that has, has never really done a whole lot in those eight, ten years. Yes, he scored 20 goals in the National Hockey League. He can put the puck in the net. Um, but a change of scenery can do amazing things for a hockey player. And the fact that this guy has put, scored 20 goals three times, is, is you can't overlook that. The guy can put the puck in the net in these preseason games I've been watching. He's much more engaged and much, much more feisty than I ever remember him when I watched him in a, in a Buffalo um, Sabre uniform. So he's going to get every opportunity in the world, and he's going to be fighting like a dog for ice time, like all those other 13 guys are. And any time you've got internal competition, guys, you know, that, that raises the bar for everybody. And any, any player that looks and says, 
I'm coming from a team that was, you know, cycling through rebuilding and cycling through uh, year after year of having some struggles. And then you look at a team like the Minnesota Wild, which we all know is on the cusp of making another step. When you come to that team, now you're like, okay, I'm going to be playing with different type players. I'm going to be playing with, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what line I'm on, I have an opportunity to contribute. And I, I think that's, that's pretty exciting when you're able to look at it. And the other that. thing that's going to be interesting, too, to see is how he, how he deals with them. He's playing in Buffalo, even Felino. Like, I'm looking at his average career numbers. He's playing 15 and a half minutes a game. How is he going to handle, how is Tyler Ennis going to handle playing 12, 13 minutes a game when you've been playing 15 your whole career? That's going to be something that's going to be uh, really interesting for me to, to watch to see how those guys handle it. He's got to stay healthy. He played a combined total yeah. of 74 games over the last two seasons. Speaking of health, uh, Tony Brew wants to know how important is a healthy Zach Parisi? I think there's no question that it's important. How healthy is Zach Parisi might be the better question. Well, I mean, none of us really know. I mean, we know that he's going to skate today for the very first time. The doctors have cleared him. You know, you do know this. If he tweaks something in his back during the summer, the fact that it's preseason and we play four, the Wild play four games in their first two weeks of the season, which is a garbage schedule as far as I'm concerned, and makes it really difficult as the season goes on, there is no hurry. Even if he could have skated a week ago, there's no hurry for him to come back. So I don't think fans need to be overly ridiculously alarmed that he hasn't skated in probably 10 days. He probably could have skated after two or three days after he tweaked something. Um, but we're, I mean... I'd be lying if I didn't say I was, I was concerned. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that he tweaked again here this summer. I don't know if it's the exact same situation, but uh, time will tell. Chuck Fletcher told me yesterday if it was a playoff game last night, he would have played, that this is certainly something that's... So there you go. That, but at the same time, I think your reason for concern is valid. Mm -hmm. You've got a guy who had a back injury a couple of years ago, spent most of a summer rehabbing it, came back last year, dealt with just about everything except a back, had <laughs> strep throat three times, an ankle, a knee, had the mumps. I mean, he had just about everything possible derail him last year other than the back. Yeah. But now you're in your early 30s, and you have to start to wonder. Every time you feel something tweak in the back, how long will it take to come back? You don't bounce back way. quite well, as quickly as you used to, and his game requires him to be able to play that one way. You know what, and we've, we've talked to players that have since retired, and they a lot of them say, the best players, the ones who have longevity to their career, obviously you have to stay healthy, but what they do is they change their game. Now, they don't change, they don't revamp their entire game. They make changes to their game that make them either uh, better with the lines that they're playing with or better with the team they're playing with or, or uh, make them better with the style of hockey. Because if you play long enough in the National Hockey League now, I mean, you're playing from a time where the game actually changes, equipment changes, players changes, styles change. I mean, if you can change your game, you'll be better off. Now, Zach Parisi, he's always been a... a, a, a I guess a grinding star. I guess that's the best way you can yeah. you can say it. He's the kind yeah, of guy who it just battles and fights and takes a beating. How long can you do that for? And and so if he does change his game to maybe not take as much of a beating but still be effective, right there's the gray area I think for Zach Parisi. Stay healthy, change your game so that you can stay healthy. But don't change your game so much that you're not playing the way that you're effective. The one thing that I think, sorry, Anthony, with, with Zach and the situation he's in is, is if, they can, if the NHL continues to call the slashing penalties and, and all the infractions, the way things have gone throughout the uh, preseason, every team's going to end up with between six and eight power plays. Um, that means there's going to be less five-on-five -five time, more power play time. That, that's... That's Parisi time, man. The power play time. You're not going to get beat up. Yeah. I mean, you're, there's, there's four of them on the ice. There's not five. You're going to be around the net. Zach's one of the best guys we've ever seen in a wild uniform around the net. Works on it every game. Um, power play goals are going to start piling up for Zach. I mean, that's what we're hoping for. Parisi's got to be wondering why the league wouldn't eliminate the cross check in the back instead yeah. of the yeah, slash. Because if you could eliminate that, he'd uh, save a little wear and tear yeah. on that back. Travis Roberts wants to know how you think Luke Cunningham has looked so far and if we'll see him sooner rather than later in the regular season. Before you answer, I'll just mention that Bruce Boudreaux last night after the game said he thought Cunnan looked a lot better at center in game two of the preseason than he did in game one. What have your impressions been? I, I think you have a very motivated guy, and, and it always goes all the way back to the development camp this summer. I mean, you had a guy that was just hustling, and he dropping the gloves, and, and he's doing it, and he's saying, he's saying, like, I want to come in here, and I want to make the team. I mean, yeah, saying that and doing it are two different things, but there's a motivated guy. I, guys like that that come in and, and will do anything and do everything to make a team doesn't mean they're going to make a team, but 
they sit on the coach's mind then. And so when later on in the season, all of a sudden you need a centerman, who do you think of first? And that, that's the kind of guy that you call up. He's going to play. <laughs> he's just he's going to will himself to play. Yep. That's just the attitude that this kid has. Um, when our scouts obviously watched him, that was a big reason why uh, we ended up taking him in the first round was, it, was his character. And, uh, you know, as the season goes on, we get later into the season, into the playoffs, um, you talked about how coaches think about certain players. When you think about going into a battle with guys like Luke Cunning, when you know he's chomping at the bit and he's in the locker room going like this and you're in the other coach's room, you feel pretty good about uh, trying to win games. Whether he starts the season with the Minnesota Wild um, is still up in the air. We don't really know. I'm assuming at some point during the season with injuries, uh, I would not be surprised to see him in a Wild uniform. But even if he doesn't play this year, uh, he's got a very, very bright future. His hockey IQ is really, really good. Face-offs, he won a ton of draws last night. I know Bruce had mentioned in his, uh, his post-game presser that uh, Luke played better in Game 2. That's pretty uh, easy to understand, uh, especially going out on the road playing your first ever NHL game. And it's obviously a situation where it'll depend on how guys are doing when they're in Iowa, but the impression these guys leave during camp goes a long way toward which guys get the first chance when it's time to look down there for help. Get noticed, man. Get noticed in training camp. I, I say this, I say this to high school kids when I was coaching high school hockey when we come in for tryouts. Get noticed. Like I want to see. Like if you hit guys, make sure you hit guys. If you're a skill guy, make sure you're you're making good plays with the puck. You know, um, you're you've only got two weeks if you're going to be in in the in, in tryouts and, and preseason here. Two three weeks, you've got to you've got to get noticed. You don't have time to sit around and wait and see what's going to happen. And, and Luke has uh, they they shot him out of a can and he's he's played well. All right, Austin Getlicker wants to know. Which player you think will have a breakout year? Each of you give me your one guy to watch for this year. I got that much time to think about it? Wow. You know, I usually John, time's up. Yeah, Who do you okay. got? Breakout year for me, I think, is uh, Charlie Coyle. I, I, I know we're, we're still waiting for Charlie to get to that next level. 18 goals for a guy that uh, of his caliber, the way he skates, the way he shoots, the way he handles a puck, the way he takes care of his body. Um, he, he's just, he is, you know, you look back at his game logs over the last few years, he's gone, um, he can be a 25 goal scorer. He's just got to eliminate those, those 12 and 15 game uh, stretches. And uh, in order to get to where he needs to get, I'd like to see him maybe get a little bit more power play time. Um, he's been doing really well in faceoffs. I don't know if it's something he worked on throughout the course of the summer, uh, but winning faceoffs as a righty because we don't, the Minnesota Wild don't have any right handed centermen might be something to look forward to. But I'm hoping Charlie can take that step. Only nine points on the power play last year for Coyle. And, yeah. you know, he had some, you mentioned a couple of the droughts, and he's had them every year. He's also had stretches where then for 10 games, 12 games he'll score eight goals yeah it's been Streaky amazing player who's your guy uh, I guess mine is is hopeful that it's a guy like Matt Dumba Matt Dumba came in as a guy that had you know all kinds of skill now when you have a guy with a lot of skill you still have to play the game right you still have to do all the the right things and so sometimes guys with skill tried to skill their way through things instead of play hockey their way through things and I don't know if you understand what I mean but if you're not playing the right way as they say and you're just trying to use your skill to get you through eventually that's going to catch up with you because there's a lot of guys in this league with skill as well. I think now he's learned how to play the game. He's, he's making better decisions. He's, he's not erratic with the puck. And if he plays enough with a guy like Ryan Suter, I think, that it, I think he's going to elevate his game, and I think it's going to be great for his confidence. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say the same guy I did last year. I thought Jonas Brodeen last year was going to take a big step forward early in the season. looked like he was headed that way, playing with Christian Follin. They, had a, they were the wild second defensive pair for the better part of the early stretch of the season. He got more power play time than he had had in the past, and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, his game tailed off in the second half. I, I think this year's got to be the year that he steps up. The Bobby Lynn wants to know, what do the Wild need to do to take the next step, not in the regular season, but in the playoffs? Well, I think, you know, that's a, that's a, like an, that's a long-winded question. I mean, um, the Wild losing in, 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 in five games the way they lost um, has to sit with the, the team. You know, um, they didn't score many goals, lost in five games. Eight had, goals. Had a really difficult time getting inside getting second chance opportunities. We, we know how great the goaltending is in this league. Um, a lot of times you're not going to score on the first shot, and, and the Wild really did not have a lot of second and third chance opportunities. you got to give the Blues a lot of credit. you got to give them some credit, but some of it has to fall on the Minnesota Wild to make sure that they get inside a lot more. And we talk about Charlie Coyle. Those are one of the guys that, that got to get dirty. you got to get inside. Um, bringing in a guy like Marcus, uh, Marcus Foligno from Buffalo, 
the guys, I mean, I think he had eight hits last night, and he's trying to put guys into the upper deck. So he's not just trying to rub guys out. Um, that's going to help guys. When you've got a few guys like that on your team, everybody gets a little bit bigger. So that's uh, hopefully can uh, help the Wild get to that next step. They scored on 4.4% of their shots in that playoff series last year. And some of that I agree with you. you got to give some of the credit to the defense and the goaltending. But it felt like they were just lacking somebody to disrupt something to change the flow of the game. And sometimes all it takes is one gr grimy goal, one yeah. gritty goal around the net, and all of a sudden the guy in the net doesn't have the supreme confidence that he had. We saw it in the next round when Allen was – very human against Nashville. Well, and let's not forget about what a playoff series is. You're playing the same team over and over again. You can surprise teams with your lineup game after game because in the National Hockey League, rarely do you face the same team two games in a row. Uh, sometimes you'll have a home-and-home -home set or something like that, but that's rare. When you're in the playoffs, you have to make adjustments, and I think in order for the Wild to be a good playoff team, they're going to have to be a team that makes adjustments game after game. Come out with something different. Yes, you shift lines around and everything, but maybe you know you can't change your entire philosophy. But if something's not working, you have to have the depth and the and the experience to make enough of a change that now the other team has to re react to you. I don't think the Wild changed enough game after game. And so the St. Louis Blues just kept doing what they were doing, and it kept working. So adjustments for me are what's going to get you through the playoffs. Paul Falcon wants to know what your thoughts are on who will, who will replace Marco Scandella on the back end. We talked about it a little bit with some of those guys, but bottom line is somebody new is going to have to step up to be. You said earlier that you need to have five guys so you can count on four that are going on a given night. So let's eliminate the top four. Who do you think is the most significant, has the best chance to become that fifth dependable guy on the back end for Minnesota? Well, you'd like to hope that it's Mikey Riley, that he can take the next step. I mean, he's, he's spent enough time now in the minors uh, to season himself, to get ready to be a pro, um, and, and understand um, how important it is to be solid defensively so you can get on the ice to show how great you are offensively. It's really difficult to be a good offensive player when your coach doesn't trust you. So um, from what I've seen so far in, in, in tryouts and in some of the scrimmages, he, he looks to me like he's much more engaged defensively. And, uh, I mean, we all know what he does offensively, the way he skates with a puck. Um, and, and, you know, the wild power play it was good last year. So he's going to get a great opportunity to take to this spot. Um, Gustav Olsen has some injuries um, over the last couple of years. We don't know. I'm sure he's got the inside track. Kyle Quincy, a guy that picked up, they picked up during the summer, he's going to have a great opportunity. Carson Soucy has been really good. He's a young kid that the Wild drafted a couple years ago in the fifth round. Long reach. Plays a lot like Marco, by the way. And uh, so a guy like him, uh, Carson Soucy, because Marco Scandella was a long player, really good on the PK, Carson Soucy might be one of those guys that you, you slide in that can play maybe 8, 10 minutes and a lot of PK time if he's one of those guys that can maybe jump in and fill some of those minutes that Marco used to, used to fill. And he's been noticed. You talked about getting notice in camp. Bruce mm -hmm. Boudreaux has noticed him and mentioned him a few times. Said he thinks he needs some games in the AHL, but... Bottom line is he's made an impression. Last question from our fans today. Donald Bledsoe wants to know how you think the Wild can avoid a midseason slump this year. They really avoided the midseason slump last year. It was the late season slump that maybe disrupted their momentum heading into the postseason. You know, and, that, and that's sometimes the difference between being a good team and a great team. Uh, you notice that other teams that have gone on to have very good seasons They'll all have a slump. I mean, every, every team has a, a section of the season that they're just not doing well, but that's where you have to find a way to get the extra point in overtime or shoot out, or that's where you have to find a way to win a game late or have your goaltender steal one. I'm telling you right now, that, that's how you avoid the eight to ten games with one point. And you, if you can avoid that, that's where your depth and experience come into play. And that, that has to happen. And they did it well last year. They didn't really have, in the middle of the season, they never had the stretch where they lost a bunch of games. But you always look back at those seasons, and Chicago would have their nine-game slump, and they'd go 1-4-4, four, and four, yeah. Yeah. where Minnesota right. would go 0-8-1. Oh, and, yeah. and, and that's a big difference when you get to the end of the season, and the points are that tight. We'll see if Minnesota can do it. The, the only real bump in the road they hit last year was late in the regular season when they went 2-9-2. Two, two. Never seemed to really get the game back heading into the postseason. A reminder that you can catch our Minnesota Wild season preview show tonight on Fox Sports North. It will immediately follow the Twins Live postgame show after the Twins and Tigers play in Detroit. Our first broadcast of the regular season comes your way on the 7th of October, game two of the regular season in Carolina against the Hurricanes. For Wes and Mike,
Thanks for watching our Minnesota Wild Q&A session here on Facebook Live.